I'm hoping this information makes it out to the medical profession at large because there are some misunderstandings about vitamin C and how it fights cancer that we're hoping to overcome with better information. And so today, I'm shooting for clarity. I always want my lectures to be clear, but probably more so than ever before, I hope that this group gets a good understanding, a good clear understanding of how vitamin C can be a very effective tool in the fight against cancer. We need really good tools to help patients overcome this rather, rather dreaded illness. Now I'm going to be talking a little bit of chemistry today, but my, remember my goal is to make it understandable. So for all of you that used to freeze up in school whenever the word chemistry was measured, mentioned, you can relax. I just want to define some very simple terms here. You need to understand this if you want to understand what makes uh, vitamin C, ascorbic acid, so special in the realm of cancer therapy. Well, there's a term called redox, and it's really part of the whole life process. But I'm sure you've heard the word antioxidant. An antioxidant is something like if you cut an apple and you leave it exposed to the oxygen, the oxygen will oxidize the surface of the apple and it will start to turn brown. And so, but if you squeeze a little bit of lemon juice on it, that's a reducing agent, it's an antioxidant. So an antioxidant reduces the oxidative effect. And so, sounds a little confusing, but as we go along here, I want you to see that this actually is kind of a circular thing in that you can, you can, re, you can oxidize, but you can also reduce. And you can regenerate some of these molecules like vitamin C to make it, kind of put it back into the, uh, the battle again and, and recharge it and give it new life so that it can do its job better than it otherwise could. There's a very interesting phenomenon that occurs around vitamin C. And I'm going to try to explain this. You know, most of us have heard the term vitamin C. Vitamin C is also ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid is the chemical term. But we refer to it, to it as vitamin C because vitamins are small amounts of something that does something else. And we know that vitamin C prevents what disease? Scurvy. Scurvy. Right, but it only takes a very small amount. And so the re recommended daily allowance to prevent scurvy is like somewhere between 60 to 90 to maybe a little bit more of milligrams of vitamin C, about the amount of vitamin C that would fit on the head of a pen. Now, do you think that amount would be enough to treat cancer? No, no, we have to think of vitamin C in terms of dosage. And so if we're gonna get into using vitamin C. Now maybe it, uh, small amounts of vitamin C could be somewhat helpful in preventing cancer, but in treating cancer we're going to have to use larger doses. So at low doses, vitamin C acts almost purely as an antioxidant, which most of us know it as. It's, it's an antioxidant. But what's surprising and which most oncologists still don't know or understand is that at much higher doses, Vitamin C can act as both an antioxidant and a pro-oxidant. Now, it's, it doesn't suddenly change. It is, it always is and always has been and always will be an antioxidant. But it enters into a special chemical reaction in the body that creates a pro-oxidant effect, which we're going to go into in just a second. So here we have uh, vitamin C acting as an antioxidant. And basically what antioxidants do is they have these, here's ascorbic acid, vitamin C. It's got these electrons and it very generously donates them to this treacherous free radical, which is, can act as a harmful oxidant to your body. It's, we think it's oxidants and excessive oxidants over time that injured the cells and set the cells up, changed the DNA, set them up for, uh, for the formation of cancer. So vitamin C, ascorbic acid, can neutralize free radicals. But when it does, once it's, once it's given its electrons away, it now becomes dehydroascorbate. This is the reduced form, I'm sorry, this is the oxidized form of vitamin C. And the body gets rid of it. So here's a specific example where an iron atom, two iron atoms, are reduced the plus three is reduced to the plus two 
by ascorbic acid, and now you have reduced iron, and the dehydroascorbic acid is just excreted in the kidneys. We're, we're not using it anymore. But what happens, what happens to this reduced iron? Well, it can interact with oxygen. What happens when you take a piece of metal, iron, uh, lying out on the, uh, on the ground, in the air, doesn't it rust? Yeah. Rusting is a form of oxidation. So it rusts uh, it, and because it interacts with oxygen and it forms an oxygen-free radical, which is very damaging, and that results in the formation of something that we all are familiar with, which is hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide. And we know that hydrogen peroxide can be used to treat wounds. We, if you know a little bit about cell biology, it, it has a regulatory effect in the, in, the, in the cell. It can be used to fight infections. Um, so this is how, uh, when you put vitamin C in and it interacts with iron, it can have a pro-oxidant effect in the body. Let's take this one step further. The, the peroxide itself can interact with more reduced iron if it's available and it will form a very, very harsh free radical called the hydroxyl radical. And this hydroxyl radical is much more potent as an oxidizing agent than even hydrogen peroxide itself is. Now here's the key part. This is the part that most doctors don't understand and so you're going to be ahead of, of most of the oncologists in the world just by understanding this one slide. Namely that if you're using vitamin C in bigger doses and you're reducing the iron in your body or the copper, any kind of metal in your body, if you reduce it, then that can go over and interact with the peroxide and form the hydroxyl radical. But if you can take this oxidized iron and once again reduce it, do you see how this is starting to form a cycle? What you need though is you need a continuous supply of high dose vitamin C. This is the IV vitamin C. If we're putting IV vitamin C in in large amounts and we're, we're reducing the iron and it's interacting with the peroxide, what we have happening is like a, a water wheel. And as long as the vitamin C, the ascorbic acid is going in and, and the oxidized form is going out, it's turning the wheel and producing more and more of the hydroxyl radical. It's the hydroxyl radical that's acting as the pro-oxidant to kill tumor cells if you have the right dosage, if you have the right dosage. And this has been the rub. This is why so many doctors and so many researchers have misunderstood vitamin C. They think of it as a little trace vitamin. But in order to get this pro-oxidant effect, you're going to have to add in large amounts of vitamin C in, in order to reach a certain threshold to where the hydroxyl radical is formed. Now this is not just me talking. Uh, this phenomenon was recently verified at the National Institutes of Health in this particular research project. Ascorbate in pharmacologic concentrations, not, not nutritional, but pharmacologic concentrations selectively generates the ascorbate radical and hydrogen peroxide in extracellular fluid in vivo. In other words, in a living body, this phenomenon happens. And so you can read about it in the proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Now coming back to what role, what role does uh, oxidants play in the body? And so we were talking about the word redox, cellular redox environment. A simple rule of thumb is that the environment of healthy cells is reducing. Not, not, in other words, the free radicals are controlled rather than oxidizing. We depend upon oxidation for metabolism, immune defense, and cell signaling purposes, but we must avoid the damage it can cause. In other words, when your oxidation gets out of control, there's too much injury, too much damage to the apple surface, it becomes rotten, too much damage to the iron, it, you can't use it anymore because it rusts too much, well, see, the body life is a process of keeping that in balance, keeping it in check. And that's why we now know, it's, it's, it's a clearly established fact, that colorful fruits and vegetables, which are rich in antioxidants, create, just what I just said, a healthy reducing environment in our cells. 
and that helps us prevent the cellular damage that can lead to cancer. So vitamin C as an antioxidant is a great preventive agent. All of your antioxidants help to control excess oxidation. But what we need, if, you, if the damage is already done and the cancer has emerged, you can't rely upon just the antioxidant properties of vitamin C. Now we need something a little bit tougher, a little bit more potent. That's where the high doses of vitamin C has been shown to uh, kill tumor cells. And that's what we call tumor cytotoxicity. It's toxic to the cells that make up tumors. So the high dose intravenous vitamin C generates hydroxyl radicals which can damage, uh, it, could, it would damage all cells except that healthy cells have a protection built in. Since peroxide is kind of a normal part of cellular physiology, healthy cells have their own protective enzyme called catalase. What do you think cancer cells have? Do you think they have catalase? No. They're low in catalase, and that's what makes IV vitamin C so slick. I, that's probably not the right scientific word, <laughs> but the fact that it can at the same time act as an antioxidant and protect your healthy cells and yet generate the, the hydroxyl radical, a very powerful radical that attacks the cells that are low in catalase, namely your, your cancer cells, that means this is almost like a smart bomb or a smart drug in the sense that it's going to strengthen your, your basic protective mechanisms, but attack the invading tumor cells. And that's why we're so excited about IV vitamin C here at the center. It's not just us, though. There's been a number of researchers who have demonstrated this phenomenon. We're not the only ones anymore that are looking into this. I think Dr. Jackson, I had him do a search on uh, IV vitamin C studies around the world, and there are over 60, I think, that are now going on so this is now, the research is starting to get behind this. But I still think the general understanding of vitamin C is that it's just a little vitamin. You drink it in your orange juice. Yes, it's, it's good to help you prevent cancer. But when you've got a really serious disease like cancer, vitamin C is not strong enough. Well, folks, I think it is strong enough if you use the right dose. We usually start people out at 15 grams. We go up to 25 keep taking their dose up, and then after we infuse the, the, the vitamin C, we, we take and do a measurement of their blood on the other side to see how much vitamin C have we gotten that concentration up to. And just to kind of give this, I, I didn't put it in here as a line, but if we were to take the vitamin C levels of everyone in the room here, assuming that no one had had a, a, an IV vitamin C, it'd be around one or one and a half. And what we're shooting for with with, uh, with cancer patients is somewhere around 350 to 400. So it's like, it's like 400 times the normal blood level of vitamin C that's required in order to really generate a good strong dose of hydroxyl radical to attack those tumor cells. And so we use the post-IVC level as a way of confirming that the dose that we're giving is right for that particular patient because each patient's different they have different diets, different diseases, different oxidative stress loads, different levels of cancer. Even the same type of cancer can be at different stages in different people. So we use that to help us guide our therapy to make sure that we're getting an adequate amount of, of dosage. This is some more of the, of the groundbreaking research that was done here at the center in the 90s where we took different lines of cancer cells uh, and then we grew them on uh, culture plates with different concentrations of ascorbate, vitamin C. And as you can see, as the concentration of ascorbate in the growth media increased, it, it, it killed, the, the percent surviving cells went down, down, down. And around three, 350 to 400, almost all, all the various cell types of cancer were, uh, were killed by this dose of vitamin C. Now this research that I just showed you, this was replicated. It was done in the 90s, but again, it was replicated at the National Institutes of Health and published in 2005. Pharmacologic ascorbic acid concentrations selectively kill cancer cells, action as a prodrug to deliver hydrogen peroxide to the tissue. So now we've got, we've got a validation of what we've been doing 
and we just need to we need to pick up the action here and find out okay how can we do what we do even better so in summary here IV ascorbate reaches cytotoxic plasma levels for only a short duration and I'm gonna this this is really this is the second part of the lecture now because I think a ho does everyone have a pretty good idea now how IV vitamin C works and it kills cancer cells but we give it usually about twice a week sometimes we give it three times a week but those plasma levels that we achieve with an IV are only high for several hours relatively short duration we do it typically about twice a week my concern is the potential exists for the emergence of IV redox chemotherapy which is the way they now refer to it at KU Med Center IV redox chemotherapy what about resistance tumor cells starting to reemerge in between IVCs and can we improve the effect of the IV uh, redox with oral vitamin C redox and something that I'm going to call redox recycling so now I'm going to enter into a little bit different discussion with you because for a while we were kind of forgetting about the value of oral vitamin C it's there's no question that IV vitamin C if you have cancer you want to do IV vitamin C but can we improve the results of IV vitamin C by using the appropriate dosages of oral vitamin C in conjunction with other specialized nutrients so now let's talk a little bit about redox recycling remember I told you the dehydroascorbate we offered them this combination beta carotene 30,000 B complex 50 to 100 12,000 milligrams of vitamin C and nowadays he's taking them up as high as 40,000 this is oral vitamin C 300 units of E 600 of selenium and 60 of zinc when you when you have a serious illness like cancer your digestive system can handle a lot more vitamin C than what it can if you're just in you know an everyday normal state of health and so he offered this to to 134 patients and there was uh, some of them took they, they entered the study but they didn't want to do the vitamins and some did and so what he found the people who took his regimen these are the various different types of cancer breast uterine ovary lung pancreas and then all types he found that the number of months survival was much higher with the people that took the vitamins compared to the number of months that people didn't so people that took the vitamins had about 45 months of survival compared to 2.6 months this is also published in the Journal of Orthomolecular Medicine totally ignored by conventional medicine but to me it's an important finding because it indicates that maybe redox synergy and high doses of oral vitamin C does have a role to play in enhancing the effectiveness of IVC therapy using vitamin C in cancer patients this was Dr. Cameron and Pauling's study where they gave terminal cancer patients 10 grams of IV vitamin C daily for 10 days and then they gave them 10 grams orally to follow and they were able to show uh, a fourfold increase in life expectancy now they thought in their paper and they said if they would have used higher doses of than 10 grams they might have even had better results and I'm going to show you that maybe they 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 indeed would have now unfortunately the uh, the when when this was published uh, back in the 70s uh, Mayo Clinic said okay we're going to try to replicate this study but they you know when you do a replication you should at least do the study the same way that the original researchers did it well the Mayo studies did not involve any IV vitamin C it was all just oral vitamin C given once a day and so they gave 10 grams of oral vitamin C to 200 late stage cancer patients uh, there's there was a lot of questions raised about how well the study was controlled but they did not show any statistical benefit this is one of the reasons why conventional medicine said hey let's just forget the whole vitamin C issue because this is the definitive study well it really wasn't but uh, that's that's kind of what happened back then now here we are bringing up the whole vitamin C thing again because we're we're getting new research findings to suggest that maybe this could be uh, a useful tool in the fight against cancer so my concluding points are that 
that high-dose high IV vitamin C has been demonstrated to generate tumor cytotoxic doses of the hydroxyl radical through redox cycling. And twice a week IV vitamin C creates short bursts of this cytotoxicity. And it makes it a very good adjunct therapy to uh, standard, uh, to standard uh, uh, chemotherapy and radiation. But what about using oral vitamin C in high dosages in order to make the IVC work even better? So the frequency and level of dosing of oral vitamin C is a critical component of any redox synergy strategy. So the next phase of our research is what level of, of oral vitamin C do cancer patients need to have in order to achieve this result? We do know that if you add lipoic acid, vitamin K, and copper, you can possibly induce this hydroxyl radical formation using just oral strategies along with the IV strategy. So again, our goal here at the center is not just to treat cancer, but to take care of cancer patients. Our goal is to give you a level of hope that goes beyond just conventional treatment. It's, it's conventional treatment plus using innovative nutritional strategies that will protect your white blood cells, protect your, your immune system, protect your health while you're fighting the cancer, and at the same time improve your overall quality of life. And so this lecture was, would not be possible today without the, the insight and vision and efforts of Dr. Hugh Reardon. So, so anyway, this, this is uh, our, uh, our contribution thus far, and I want to just fill you in with uh, where we've come to this stage. And so if there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them at this point. People were asking, how do we, how do, we do it? Well, when, when Dr. Reardon first started doing IVCs, the, the, the vitamin C vials came in a 7.5 gram vial. So he gave people two vials, and that's where the 15 grams came in. And you don't really find those too much anymore, but we still kept the 15 grams. It's kind of by tradition we give people a 15 gram vitamin C. We know a lot about it, and I'm going to show you some, a little research thing we did. But the second day we give them 25 grams, and the third day we give them 50 grams. And after each one, we do a post-IVC saturation level to kind of find out what their oxidative burden is. Um, and then that can give us some points on the curve to, to figure out where, where they ought to go home. If they're not from Wichita, we want to send them home with a recommendation for whichever doctor they're going to go to. So we draw the post-IVC saturation level immediately, immediately upon completion of the IVC or within about 10 minutes. You draw it from the vein on the opposite arm. You have to use proper specimen handling and shipping. Uh, I would suggest sending it to a lab familiar with doing dilutional vitamin C levels since, you're gonna ha since it's going to be such a high level. And the post-IVC result can be correlated with tumor burden, staging, and concurrent conventional treatment plan in order to set up a, a, a dosing plan for the IVC. And so just to kind of demonstrate that, uh, we just pulled, I, I don't know, it was about 20 charts somewhat randomly. And uh, we had 12 people who had no cancer. We had three people who had kind of a stage one local. We had uh, stage two, seven people that were kind of a regional uh, metastasis, and then eight people that had distant metastases. And these were their post, I, I averaged out their post uh, IVC saturation levels. And this is what we found is that healthy people after a 15 gram vitamin C have about 150. And remember that the normal plasma C level is about one to two. 0.6 to 2. And so uh, just uh, doing a 15 gram, you're jumping it up about 100 times normal, up to around 150. But someone with local, you know, just a local, uh, maybe a small tumor, a stage 1, uh, that's going to increase their oxidative burden just a little bit. Stage 2, higher oxidative burden. And of course, uh, stage 3 and 4 are going to have uh, more oxidative stress. So you can see that uh, by just looking at that first post-IVC, you kind of get an idea of how much oxidative stress their body is under just from that alone. Judith Stout uh, published a nice little thing in a uh, bibliography in the Journal of Orthomolecular Medicine where she showed that uh, by reviewing the literature that antioxidants do not protect cancer cells against free radical and growth inhibiting effects of standard Therapy, on the contrary, they enhance its growth inhibiting effects on tumor cells. 
and they actually protect the normal cells against adverse effects. Charles Simone, uh, The Truth About Breast Cancer, Antioxidants Enhance Treatment Kill Rate and Reduce Treatment Side Effects. Lots of studies to back that up. He, it, it involves some 8,500 patients, 5,000 of whom took antioxidants. 4,700 of the 5,000 showed increased survival. And antioxidants not only reduce oxidative stress, but they may be part of what's helping to restore aerobic metabolism. CoQ10, for example, may be a very important part of restoring aerobic metabolism. And then, of course, Abram Hoffer. Uh, we just can't say enough about his contribution. Uh, in many ways, it was his encouragement that uh, led to Dr. Reardon doing the, doing the uh, RECNAC project. Um, you know, he had really a, a thousand cases of people that he followed that uh, he had them use an oral program, but very high doses of vitamin C. And then he, I think he was using what I call redox synergy. If you get enough antioxidants working together, you may be able to take that dehydroascorbate that's being formed in the redox cycling and recycle it back again as a ascorbic acid. Um, so uh, he's credited with being the person who got Dr. Linus Pauling interested in vitamin C. Summary slide here. The rear and IVC protocol addresses cancer in a comprehensive way. It boosts immunity, stimulates collagen formation, inhibits hyaluronidase, relieves cellular hypoxia and restores aerobic metabolism, restores mitochondrial functioning, including apoptosis, inhibits angiogenesis and reduces tumor nutrient supply. It corrects scurvy. scurvy. It's immune activating. Uh, I guess I mentioned that. It supports detoxification systems in the body, relieves pain and promotes well-being, potentiates chemotherapy and radiation, reduces side effects and toxicity of conventional therapy. So would you say it's a plausible oncologic adjunct in cancer patient care? I wouldn't say that. I would say it's a premier oncologic adjunct in cancer patient care. Of course, I'm, I'm biased.